Welcome to unit number seven for the PAD 4604 class. This unit is primarily a review of chapters one through six of the Johnson textbook, and it is compiled as a review for quiz number one. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to review all eight of the questions for the quiz, and I'm going to show you where the answers for each one of those questions can be found in the textbook, as well as in the PowerPoint presentations which were made available to you in each one of the learning units. The quiz is due February 22nd, Sunday at midnight. I ask you to prepare a Word document that contains all of your answers, so you can work on this throughout the week, and all you have to do before Sunday at midnight is go in and cut and paste each one of your answers into the answer space on the Blackboard exam. So technically it is a Blackboard exam, but more realistically, a, a better representation of it would be is to think of it as eight short essay questions that you work on at home, and all you have to do is cut and paste them into the Blackboard exam before midnight Sunday. So this exam is all created around a fictitious city called Plainsville. You are a person in three different roles within the community. One is in city management, one is in the nonprofit sector, one is in the school board. So, so this quiz is meant to place you in this city in three different roles. So you need to get your head wrapped around who you are uh, in each one of these questions. Um, there's going to be three hot button issues that you're going to deal with with this quiz. One hot button issue is related to a proposed Islamic mosque which is going in right here in this neighborhood. The next hot button issue that comes up in this quiz is related to a stadium which somebody donated a lot of money to in order to have it built at this school here outside of city limits. So it's important here to note where the city limits are because these are the dynamics that play out in cities throughout the United States. Uh, because of white flight, um, it's an undeniable fact of our lives in the United States that the inner cities have problems because mortgages were made available to individuals who moved to the suburbs but the mortgage guarantees that made all of those suburban homes possible were not made available to anybody within the inner city core. So as a result of that everybody moved out, bought their houses, got their mortgages with 10 percent down outside of the cities and nobody would lend to people who were left in the cities where there were, let's face it, black people. So that's why it's important here to note where the city limits are. This is an ethical problem that happened from the 1930s through to the 1960s before it was blocked by the Fair Housing Act in 1968. So we are now living with the dynamics of something that was put in place by government. It was an unethical decision by government. And it came about because FDR needed the support of Southern Democrats in order to pass his social safety net agenda. But the only way the Southern Democrats would support FDR and make this legislation possible was by eliminating any benefits that might be accrued to African Americans. Okay? So that's that's where this quiz comes from. This quiz, these quiz questions are built around the idea that we created this dynamic unethically. We, through unethical administrative practices, created the dynamics that play out in this city. So pay attention to where these city boundaries are on this map. There's a highway that goes right through the middle and there's a railroad track and there's the old saying, live on the wrong side of the tracks. Well, that was very much a part of what these unethical decisions from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s created, is that we created these wealthy white suburbs in our cities. So this stadium is being proposed up here, outside of the city limits, in a school that was built in a white neighborhood in order to get away from this old high school here, which is too close to these less desirable neighborhoods according to the people who live up there. Right? And granted, even the people who live here would consider it less desirable and they would like to live out there. But the dynamics are in place that prevent that. So now we're living with that. And so now we have another third high school down here. So this one is a struggling high school. This one is a prospering high school. And this one is what I call a rough high school. So that's the second hot button issue. The third hot button issue is an abortion clinic that is being proposed here to serve the inner city population. And um, so let's get into the quiz. I apologize for the length of the preamble to each question, but that's important that I have to set up these dynamics because ethical decisions are problematic. They are hot button issues because there is a lot of backstory that you need to become familiar with. So I can't do a quiz for you without creating a lot of backstory. So there's a lot of reading involved. And actually, may, it may take you as long to read these quiz questions as it takes to answer some of them, because I don't want long answers. 
I need short, concise, well thought out answers that touch on all of the hot button issues, touch on all of the ethical challenges that you're going to be faced in these three roles that you assume. And so that's why I need to give you a lot of preamble. So here's that preamble that you need to read in the quiz. So make sure you download the PDF file and print it out so that you can read this very, very carefully and reread it and reread it and reread it. It's very important that you get all of the nuances that are in this preamble as well as the preamble to each one of the questions. As I mentioned, you should answer the following questions in a generic Word file. So when it comes time to upload your answers, you just cut and paste. Now you have to use, for Blackboard, you can't use right click on a mouse. You have to use Control C to copy and then Control V to paste. So highlight the answer itself. You don't need anything else. If you create a Word file, that alleviates the problem that if there's any challenge at all with Blackboard, you can at least send it to me as a separate file. Okay. So, questions one through four are related to the Islamic Mosque. Imagine you are the city manager in Plainsville. You are a white Christian female who lives in the wealthy white neighborhood. If you remember the map, the uh, white neighborhood is up here at the top. And the Islamic population primarily lives over here. And they want to build a mosque in between the two populations. So, you are a wealthy white female that lives up here in this neighborhood. Remember, you are female, you are white, you are Christian. And beyond that, keep reading. You have a husband and you have two children. The director of the planning and permitting department has just placed the completed development permit for a proposed Islamic mosque on your desk. The planning department has prepared this impartial analysis. Remember, the planning department doesn't get it approved. The planning department makes a scientific analysis and they are impartial. They tell you these are the pros, these are the cons, okay, for the application, and have listed all of the pros and the cons that they see are related to the building permit. Based on their analysis, it is obvious that the building of the mosque will have enormous advantages to the community. At the top of the logic is the argument that the lot for the developing of the mosque has long been vacant and an eyesore, and the surrounding infrastructure would all benefit by the upgrades that will be funded largely by the construction of such a large project. The county has even offered to widen the roads and build sidewalks that will improve access for students to the nearby high school. So the mosque is here, the high school is here. Nearby high school, which everyone admits is in rough shape and has long been neglected. Okay, so these are the dynamics in play. The problem is that there has been enormous opposition to the building of the mosque ever since the city's conservative newspaper. This happens in a lot of, this is why it's a rural town and this is why it's in a Midwestern state, in my scenario. The city's conservative newspaper, which is the largest media outlet in the city, had published an article stating that the lot had been purchased by a wealthy Muslim philanthropist. Your own church congregation, you being the city manager, your own church congregation has been a major player in this opposition and your pastor especially has been the most vocal spokesperson, seeking every opportunity to be featured in the news stories. Even you have been forced to admit that the media, for the most part, has been heavily biased against the Islamic community, going so far as to publish material that is not supported by the facts of the case. In your status as a white female Christian who lives in the wealthy white neighborhood, you have deliberately been silent on the issue at church until now, waiting for the report that just arrived on your desk. Okay, so this is shaping up to put you in an ethical box. Prominent fellow members of your church congregation have made thinly veiled threats that if you do not support the congregation in opposing the building of the mosque, remember you're the city manager and your congregation is saying this to you as your city manager because they know how your decision will weight the outcome. Okay? They have made thinly veiled threats that if you do not support the congregation in opposing the building of the mosque, you would in all likelihood be shunned to the point that you would have to look for a new faith community. Your neighbors, meanwhile, have not been so vocal in their opposition. Their concerns were easily mitigated by what the city planners did in negotiating road improvements and improvements to the city's infrastructure. So your neighborhood, your, your neighbors are not as bad as your church community. Your neighbors, maybe they, some of them drive through there and they've seen this vacant lot and they're glad to see something developing on it and it's going to get new pavement, new sidewalks, and the high school is going to be improved a little bit. So your neighbors are kind of on that side of the argument, but your church congregation is definitely not. Okay, so this is a quiz, not a research paper. Keep your answer short and on point. About 150 words is ideal, which is a decent sized paragraph, or about 10 lines of text in 12 point font. Okay, if you allow your answers to go to over 250 words, I don't want to read them all, okay? Keep them short, keep it tight, keep it concise. There are only a few points that I'm looking for in this argument, and I'm going to show you where to find the answers. 
so that you keep your argument to those nice tight points. Okay, so in your capacity as the city manager now, you have announced a public hearing where the case for final approval of the building permit will be discussed and you are now formulating your presentation that you're going to give at this public hearing. Keeping in mind who you are, remember you're the city manager, write a 150 word argument for where you see yourself in Lawrence Kohlberg's three levels of moral development in this case, level one, level two, or level three. Okay, there is no wrong answer here. I need you to establish where you are in this progression of moral development. There is no wrong answer. Just remember you, in the context of this question, are a female white Christian who lives in a wealthy white neighborhood and you are likely to be shunned by your church congregation if you pick the side of an unpopular minority population in the city. You can place yourself in a mature, ethically evolved position, which would be level three, uh, where you focus on the entire community for this argument. You can place yourself there, or in the argument that you can also choose another starting point for your argument, place yourself in a primitive state where you feel strongly swayed by your personal views. Kohlberg's three levels of moral development are explained on page 193 in the Johnson textbook, so I'm telling you exactly where to go so that you research your answer with the material in the textbook. This isn't something you pull off the top of your head. I need you to place yourself in this person's position, then I need to have you place yourself in your own developmental process for ethical decision making, and then start answering your question. Okay? They are highlighted on slide Kohlberg's Three levels of moral development are also highlighted on slide eight of the chapter six PowerPoint presentation. The PowerPoint presentation can be downloaded from inside the Learning Unit 7 Blackboard folder. So right where you got this, where you, where you linked to get this video, you will also find that PowerPoint presentation in the Learning Objectives section. Your answer needs to clearly justify why you chose to place yourself where you did based on what has been described in the preamble here. Okay, so here's the slide which I'm talking about. There's actually a few on either side of this, so you'll probably want to go to that section of the PowerPoint and through that, that those pages of the textbook and read kind of what's going up to that point. If you haven't read the textbook, this is going to be a really hard quiz to take. So I'm assuming that you've read the textbook and you've watched the PowerPoint and, and leafed your way through these PowerPoint slides. So this should not be the first time you've seen this slide, okay? Kohlberg's three levels of moral development Level one is this, what he calls pre-conventional thinking, and there's two stages. Level two is conventional thinking, and there's two more stages. Level three is preconceptual or principled reasoning, which Johnson admits very few people find themselves at that level. You, as potential graduates here, should be placing yourself at this level three position. A person who is a city manager should also probably be in stage three, stage four, but more likely stage five or stage six. So be careful where you place yourself. You can choose to place yourself in level one or level two, level one, stage one or stage two, but you're setting yourself up to make a really tough argument because that's not where Johnson goes with this. So I would strongly recommend that you choose level three, four, five, or six where you place yourself. And, and put yourself, and the reason why I give you this flexibility of placing yourself in one of these positions before you start your argument is this this may actually be where you fit and feel yourself naturally right now where you want to do good but you're still pulled the other direction by let's face it selfish motives and nobody wants to be thrown out of their church community but by the same token you're a city manager so you're conflicted so where are you going to place yourself before you answer the rest of this question so this is important that you read the whole quiz very, very carefully before you even start answering these questions. And in some cases, you may actually want to think about and formulate an answer, especially for question number four, which is coming up, before you come back and answer question number one. And you'll see why in a minute. Question number two, worth 10 points. As the city manager, by relying upon a utilitarian argument, make a case that either supports issuing the building permit or recommends that the building permit not be approved. Remain consistent with how you answered question number one. You may choose either option, support or deny the building permit, but whatever option you choose, you must use a utilitarian argument. Okay? In making your utilitarian argument, it is recommended that you utilize slides one through four of the chapter five PowerPoint slides that the textbook publisher provided. The PowerPoint presentation can be downloaded from inside learning unit number seven, so that's once again the learning unit where you found this video. 
In the textbook, the utilitarian argument can be found on pages 157 to 159. So I'm telling you exactly where to go to answer this question. Okay, two points. Here's the slides, the utilitarian argument, um, and there's four slides. Okay, so let's go to question number three, 15 points. Still answering as the city manager, who is a white female Christian who lives in a wealthy white neighborhood, for this question, you must name which three of the nine virtues of character you will personally rely upon as you prepare for your presentation at the public hearing. Remember that different virtues might be required if you felt justified in denying the building permit than if you were to support it. Okay, certain virtues, we, we all have more of certain virtues than we have of others. Some virtues will say, yeah, I'm pretty connected to my community. And other virtues will say, I am a champion for the underdog. And there's nine virtues here. So having strengths in three of those nine virtues could provide you with a very different baseline for your decision-making process. So tell me which three of the nine virtues you chose, and it will depend upon whether you are supporting this building permit to go ahead and build the mosque, or whether you are leaning more towards denying the building permit so that they can't build the mosque. Okay, here's a hint for you. If you support the building permit, it means that you're likely to be thrown out of your church congregation, and you have to be prepared to live with those consequences. If you deny the building permit, it likely means that acceptance by the church congregation in this community is very important as a value in the entire community. Okay, not just to you personally. It, 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 some communities are very, very tight around a single church. And those values necessarily will be very different than a community that is a live and let live community. Okay? So I want you to give a one sentence justification for each of the three virtues that you selected. Remember, you're going to pick three of the nine, and I want you to give a one sentence justification for why you picked each of those three. The nine virtues are summarized on slides five to seven of the chapter three PowerPoint slides, which are found inside Learning Unit 6 on Blackboard. The nine virtues are expanded in the textbook on pages 78 to 89. It is highly recommended that the learning from hardship argument be used in your answer if you choose to support the building permit. You're going to suffer some hardship because you're probably going to get thrown out of the community, out of your church congregation. Okay, slides 24 to 26 will outline the hardship consequences. It is highly recommended that the identifying values argument be used in your answer if you choose to recommend that the building permit be denied. That's on slides 29 to 31 if you want to go that direction because identifying your values will be an argument that you want to make. So three sentences, really short, about the three values that you have chosen as the highest priority for this person that you, this fictitious person that you have assumed the identity of. And then after you make those three arguments, then finish your argument by either saying, this is how hardship is going to play, or this is how identifying values played into my decision. Once again, about 150 words, 10 lines of text. If you went with the argument that's likely going to see you thrown out of your church community, here's the learning from hardship argument. And here's the slide from the identifying values if you are more leaning toward denying the building permit. And there's two slides there. Question number four, the final one relating to the Islamic mosque. The reason I put this scenario on the quiz is because I need you to understand that it is always wrong, in every instance, to be a susceptible follower. Always wrong. Johnson makes that very clear in the textbook. He puts together five types of susceptible followers as you now enter into your working career you will need to be able to identify susceptible followers in your organization because they're very dangerous ethically. Okay? Because they will always follow other people rather than follow you. And even if they do follow you, if they worship you, they're still going to behave unethically because they're always going to be trying to please you as their boss. So all of us can be susceptible followers. Now, the way I've set this city manager up, I've set her up so that she will be susceptible to certain pressures from within her community to do an unethical thing. Her decision is going to impact the lives of a lot of people. Whether she chooses to support this, the building of this mosque or she chooses to deny the building permit, 
Either way, many, many people are going to be impacted by her decision, and she is going to be prone to a certain type of unethical followership. And I need you to identify which one of the five is most likely to be her challenge. And that's all you have to do for question number four. It's only worth five points of the exam. So as you create your character, and as you flesh out her argument, I need you to first think of which susceptible follower type she is, and then that will be a common thread throughout your argument. But she has to be able to overcome her tendency to be this kind of a susceptible follower. Okay, so I need you to identify which one of the five she was. So you can do this in a question, you can do this in a draft form before you start and do questions one, two, and three. But then when you come back to this question, and you, as you read your answers for questions one, two, and three, I need you to clearly identify whether or not you kept true to that susceptible followership out of the five types that you chose. Okay? Because there will be pressure on her to do an unethical thing, and I need you to identify where that pressure is coming from. And that's what this question is for. Remember, the susceptible followers are highlighted on three slides, which I've told you about. The conformers or the colluders are the two general archetypes, and the three types of conformers are listed on this slide, and the two types of colluders are listed on this slide. Okay, now we're on to the next problem, which is about the high school stadium up here. Imagine you are a black male school board member elected from the middle class black neighborhood that sends their children to the rough high school. Okay, so that's here, middle class black neighborhood, but your high school is here, and on the other side of the high school is the inner city. And that's kind of what makes this, this is also, imagine this as the oldest high school in the city, and it's kind of been neglected. So not only is the building rough, and the facilities are kind of rough, but the student population is kind of rough because it's pulling them from the inner city. But you are, you and your family live out here in the middle class black neighborhood, and that's where your kids go to school. Okay, this aging high school has no proper stadium, and spectators have to sit on a few portable metal bleachers to watch their kids play football. As a result of this, all of the city games between the three high schools in the city are played at either the prospering high schools up here or the struggling high school down here. Okay, because you don't have a stadium. So if it's a citywide game, if it's the finals, they can't play at your high school because there's no stadium at all and there's just these ruffled bleachers that you can, the parents can come and watch their kids practice off of. The prospering high school in the Northern White neighborhood has a 15-year-old stadium, but it's still the largest stadium. It's older, but it's still the largest. And the struggling high school on the south side, which has a newer stadium, is still too small, and spectators typically end up standing in the end zone. So this, it has been a priority for the city, for the school board, the school district, which includes the county by very nature. School districts typically encompass the county surrounding the city boundaries as well. So the, that, that's why the city boundaries are important, because this school district makes decision based on the entire suburban metropolitan area, not just the city limits. Notice that two of the schools are outside of the city limits in this example here. Last year the city approved a budget, the city and the school board, approved a budget that included money to build stage one of a new stadium for the rough high school. But a wealthy white philanthropist who graduated from the prospering high school just died tragically young and he left a large gift to his old high school to fund 75% of the cost of building a legacy stadium in his name. The one condition was that the community come up with matching funds for the other 25%. The money in the budget that was to build stage one precisely matches how much would be needed so the construction of the new legacy stadium at the, at the prospering high school could begin immediately. So let's imagine the guy graduated in one of the first years they went and he's and, and, but and he's incredibly wealthy, his family's wealthy, and he had a car accident, and his life insurance money got put into a foundation, and he wants to build a... He, he might have thought he was going to live until he was 80, and this new stadium would be something that the new high school that he went to could benefit from long time off in the future, but he died tragically young. And so the money's come in available right away, soon, immediately, and, and it stipulates that 25% of the funding for the new stadium has to be put up by the community itself. So we've got potential conflict here. Of the seven school board members, three members from the white northern suburbs 
are pressuring at least one of the other four school board members to side with them on an upcoming vote so that construction on the new Legacy Stadium could start immediately. The mainstream media, remember it's a conservative newspaper, is calling the proposed magnificent new stadium the pride of the city that every high school student would benefit from. What is not getting any media coverage is the fact that the football team from the rough high school has dominated in city sports for the past 15 years since the prosperous new high school was built outside of the city limits in all white suburbs. The football team from the rough high school has also finished in the final four for the state championships for as long as anyone can remember. The prospering high school football team has never won a city tournament since their school was built. Okay, these are all dynamics that come into play here. We all know, and I'm not pulling this example out of a hat. This is, this is Miami Northwestern High School, okay? This is an example taken precisely from Miami Northwestern High School. The three white suburban city school board members who are lobbying to win over a fourth member of the school board are all prominent members of the state Republican Party and are known to have sympathized with people that are affiliated with the right-wing political fringe who were demanding that President Obama produce more than a photocopy of his Hawaiian birth certificate. Their politics are very clearly oriented toward a philosophy that the inner city poor are lazy and any government program that supports them actually contributes to this laziness. On the other hand, you and one other black member of the school board are known supporters of the state Democratic Party while the other two school board members are Latinos from the area of the struggling high school down here and they refer to themselves as independents. So now we've got the political dynamics in this city coming into play. Here's the question for 12 points. You are putting together a different proposal for the school board to vote on. Not only are you adamant that the school board not use any public funds in the building of the proposed new legacy stadium at the Prosperous High School, but you are going to propose that every effort be made to convince the foundation in charge of the philanthropist's estate that it would be a grievous breach of trust to spend any money at all on a new stadium at the Prospering High School. Your argument will be that this would send the wrong message to all of the athletes throughout the city. As the school board meeting date approaches where this hot button issue will be voted on, you are preparing your argument that you hope will win the support of the two independent members so that there will be four voters in support of your idea. Acting in your role of this black male Democratic Party elected school board member who not only represents the middle class community here, but also the inner city poor, who attend the same school, this question asks you to make a Kantian argument that you hope would win the support of the two independent school board members. The framework for a Kantian argument can be found in the Johnson textbook on pages 159 to 161. The PowerPoint slides are part of chapter 5, slides 5 to 7, which can be downloaded from Blackboard Inside Learning Unit 7, which is where you found this video. Again, an answer of about 150 words is ideal, which is one paragraph or about 10 lines of text. If you allow your answer to go over 250 words again, you will lose points. So the Kant's categorical imperative, here's the slides, second one and the third one. And question number six, were 13 points. You, still in your role as this black male elected school board member who not only represents the middle class black community adjacent to the high school, but also the inner city poor who attend that same school, are fully aware that one of the biggest city newspapers, the one that's unapologetically supportive of the white Republican candidates in every election, has already cast your argument as an affirmative action plan for coercing the two undecided school board members into supporting your idea. The newspaper is accusing you of framing this as a decision that is wholly based on the racial makeup of the two competing high schools. The deserving population will lose something intended for them to a population that did nothing to earn that kind of a donation. Okay? This is how affirmative action arguments always go. A deserving population is playing a zero-sum game where an undeserving population is going to take something from them that they didn't earn. Okay, write a reply to the newspaper in about 150 words that either agrees with this accusation or refutes it. When I say write a reply to the newspaper, you know that these newspaper representatives will be at this school board meeting and you know they will have their half of the room supporting the three school board members from the white suburbs and the wealthy white neighborhood up here near the Prosperous High School. So your reply is to that audience. Write a reply that either agrees with this accusation or refutes it. 
you will earn full marks taking either position because both positions can easily be supported with what you learned in the Michael Sondell video lectures and by how I responded to your student submissions in my Sunday Summary Week 4 discussion video. That link to that video is found in Learning Unit 5. You will not earn full marks if you simply state your winning argument without also stating the losing argument that will be pitted against you. You need to make it clear why your argument is superior in its logic. So, you need to, in your answer here, we're 13 points, you need to kind of present really quickly in a sentence or two both sides of this argument that you're making. Because you can go either direction. You can say, yes, this is affirmative action, and I fully support affirmative action. Or you can say, this has absolutely nothing to do with affirmative action, and this is why. Either way, there's going to be two sides in your argument. The side that the wealthy white suburbs up north are going to make, and the newspaper, and your side. Present them both, and tell me, in your answer, why your argument is the winning argument. What makes your logic superior to theirs. Okay, questions number seven and eight. Now we're moving on to hot button issue number three, which is the abortion clinic. For these two questions, you need to imagine yourself as the executive director of an abused women's shelter that provides temporary housing and relocation services for women who have children under the age of 12. Your organization is one of the most successful and prestigious organizations of its kind anywhere in the United States, and you are in high demand as a guest speaker at conferences where everybody is trying to do what you have done here in Plainsville. Okay, so I've set you up as an executive director in the nonprofit sector. So now we've, we've gone from a city employee to a school board member, an elected official, and here you are an executive director in the nonprofit sector. As it relates to the abortion question, however, you, as this executive director, have never taken a side. You have remained neutral on the topic. You have managed to dance around the topic by assuring any who ask that you are a devout Christian, but by also assuring people that individual circumstances for women are too complicated for uninformed outsiders to be allowed any influence in judging what a woman's ultimate choice will be. In keeping with this stance, your organization refers women who are faced with an unwanted pregnancy to either a faith-based organization for support or to Planned Parenthood. You do, however, have one position that you expand on at every opportunity. So this is your argument. When you get pressured in this situation, you deflect that pressure by saying this. Any woman who chooses to carry a baby full term absolutely must have the full support of the entire community to ensure that the child feels wanted and that the parent who raises that child will never worry about the food for that child nor question whether the medical needs of the child will be attended to. Early childhood education and good schools are also one of your highest priorities and you are a fierce opponent to those who argue for cutting services to the poor, especially in the inner city neighborhood. And what a wonderful position to take for somebody who has to work with women and young children in their worst days of their life. A decision to end a pregnancy is never an easy decision in your mind. As this executive director, you want to say to anybody who asks and who will listen, it would be a lot easier for a woman to go ahead with a pregnancy on those days of her life that are the most painful for her it would be easier for a woman to make a decision if she knew that there was a safety net for her baby should she choose to carry that baby full term. So personally, from my mind, and, and, and this is who I embedded into this character, this executive director here, personally in my mind, I think anybody who says abortion should be illegal should be willing to write a check for the care and keeping of that child until that child is 15, 16, 17 years old. Because you can't say, no, she can't have an abortion and point to this awful, awful, awful person who's thinking of having an abortion. You can't point to that woman and say, you're killing a baby without saying our society is not going to give you any help in caring for that child. So that's always an empty argument for me that says, you know, you have to have your baby, but I'm going to wash my hands of any responsibility for that, ch that child. Especially if that baby is being born into an inner city environment. Especially if that baby is being born into a woman who was in an abusive relationship and is being beaten by the father of that child inside her. And now she says, 
I can never get out of this situation, which is an awful, terrible, horrible situation, because I'll never be able to care for this child if I leave my husband, who beats me. So you see how difficult the situation is for this executive director. That's the scenario I wanted to paint for you from an ethical standpoint as to what this executive director has to face every day of her working life. Okay, carrying on with the preamble. Because of your relationship with Planned Parenthood, you are the executive director of this abused women's shelter, and you have a good relationship with Planned Parenthood. Because of this good relationship with Planned Parenthood, when they secured grant funding to open their own clinic in Plainsville, they came to you for support in their bid for rezoning of the building on the south side of downtown where they hope to open the clinic. So Planned Parenthood has meeting rooms and they have rented space or they own their own building in many cities throughout the United States. Um, Planned Parenthood primarily does counseling. And so they've already got this counseling center in Plainsville, but they don't have a clinic where they can offer medical services to women. Okay. So Planned Parenthood has come to you and asked for your support in their bid to get a site for their clinic rezoned so that they can actually put a clinic in Plainsville. The worst kept secret in Plainsville is the unspoken subtext that this clinic will also do abortions in addition to having other medical services for women. One day a week they will have an abortion doctor come into Plainsville and do abortions at this proposed clinic. Nobody's talking about that out loud, but everybody knows that that's what's going to be done. Until now, for women who had no health insurance, remember this is where they want to put this clinic is in the inner city community where women typically would have no health insurance. Planned Parenthood has been financing trips to the nearest city which is two hours away so that the medical needs of these uninsured women can be taken care of. Not just abortions, all medical needs that are specifically related to women's health issues. Because they're dealing with a population that has no health insurance. So anything related to women's health issues Planned Parenthood is willing to take care of in their clinics. They don't just do abortions. There's another six days a week that they're open doing all of the other things that women with no health insurance need done from a medical perspective. Until now, for women who had no health insurance, they were being sent to the nearby city. The demand for the services has been so high, however, particularly among the very poor women on the south side, that Planned Parenthood decided to open their own clinic right in the neighborhood where they have the highest demand. Until yesterday, you're the executive director day, uh, you're the executive director of the abused women's shelter. Until yesterday, you had continued to stay neutral on the issue, but late last night, the executive director from Planned Parenthood phoned to tell you that they were in the midst of reacting to a bomb threat at their counseling center where they had been holding a board meeting. Everybody was safely outside the building, but the bomb squad was going to take several hours before they could declare the building safe. You offered to allow them to use your boardroom so that they could finish the business of their meeting. Now you are rethinking how neutral you can remain on this contentious issue. You have made two decisions. Question number seven, the first decision, worth ten points. Your first decision was easy. You have decided to release a public statement and denounce any organization that does not come out strongly against this kind of a threat of violence. To answer this question, write down a public statement that you will make by focusing your comments on how a bad leader can create a climate where an ideology of hate can germinate. Pull your statements from page 3 to 7 of the Johnson textbook where he talks about seven types of bad leaders. Slides 4 through 11 from the chapter 1 PowerPoint also cover the traits of these bad leaders in detail. You can download the PowerPoint slides from Learning Unit 5 on the blackboard. Okay, seven types of bad leaders. They are incompetent, they are rigid, they are intemperate, they are callous, they are corrupt, they are insular, and they are evil. Following this slide in the PowerPoint presentation, they have one slide or two slides dedicated to each one of these bad leaders. Question number eight. Your second decision is a more difficult one. As a person who has worked to shelter oppressed women all of your life, and as a therapist who has worked with the young children who have witnessed emotional and physical abuse from a young age, you have a unique perspective on how evil is manifest in the life of a vulnerable woman. To you, the idea that a coward would phone in a bomb threat just to terrorize loving and supportive people whose only purpose is to offer a broad range of support services to women who find themselves faced with one of the most agonizing decisions of their life is beyond repugnant, and you have decided to issue a longer press release to the media at a press conference later today. So the first question, question number seven, was a short statement about what kind of leader created an environment 
in which a person would feel somehow justified in making a bomb threat against other human beings who are also striving in every way possible to help the same population that you in your mind, the guy who phoned in the bomb threat or the lady who phoned in the bomb threat, they, they had something in their mind and that, that, that thought in their mind didn't materialize out of thin air. Somebody planted that thought in that person's mind who made the bomb threat. What kind of leader was that person listening to when he or she thought that a bomb threat was justified against other people who also want to help the same population? Women on the worst day of their life. Okay? So that's your first, that's question number seven. That's a short press release that you're saying the problem is not with the person who made the bomb threat. The problem is with a leader somewhere out there in our society who planted that thought in that person's head. That person didn't come up with that thought on their own. That thought came from a leader who gave marching orders to a follower. And that follower somehow had justified in their own mind that terrorism was justified in defending unborn babies. Okay? So what kind of leader? Question number seven is, what kind of leader would teach that? Now, question number eight is a longer press release that is going to actually present your position. And you can go either two ways. You can either be pro-life or you can be pro-choice on this decision. Both will earn full answers in this quiz. And you have to, and I'm going to tell you how to make both arguments here. Write a press release that you would issue as the executive director of a women's shelter and licensed counselor who works with abused women. Open your press release with a reference that invokes the idea of John Rawls' veil of ignorance and go from there. So I want your opening sentence, maybe two sentences, in this answer, which is a press release, to ask people to go back into the veil of ignorance that John Rawls talks about. John Rawls' coverage. Uh, Johnson's, Johnson's coverage of John Rawls' Veil of Ignorance can be found on pages 162 to 164 of the textbook or on slides 8 to 11 of the chapter 5 PowerPoint. Okay? Here it is. Justice is Fairness. This is the opening slide. It talks about the Veil of Ignorance and it talks about how to apply the John Rawls model and it talks about cautions with the John Rawls model. Now you don't have to do anything about this. I'm not asking you to expand anything on John Rawls' arguments. I am asking you to open your press release with a statement that tells people to, that asks people to put themselves back into a situation where they are experiencing this veil of ignorance. So you have to understand what the veil of ignorance is before you write that statement. But all you need to do is just the statement that says, this is what the veil of ignorance asks you to do. Okay. After invoking the veil of ignorance, you can go in two directions with your argument, depending on if you want to be seen as pro-life or pro-choice. One argument fits better than the other for pro-life, take your pick. The first argument can be made by following Johnson's faulty decision-making path in Chapter 2. So rather than reread pages 48 to 60, which is a lot of reading, the slides in this case are really good. So you may choose to just follow the slides in creating your argument. There are slides 9 to 17 from Chapter number 2, which can be found in Learning Unit 5. So on the faulty decision-making path, there are four slides that make your argument in that regard. And primarily the focus is on having a moral imagination. The alternative argument to using a faulty decision-making model can be made by focusing on Johnson's treatment of evil, which is covered in pages 119 to 126, and the slides covering evil are slides 1 to 10 of chapter 4. That can be downloaded from Learning Unit 6. So he talks about the faces of evil and perspectives on evil. And there's more slides there, of course. I only showed two of the slides. Um, so you can expand on that if you're going to go with the alternative argument. Both arguments should conclude with ideas pulled from Johnson's treatment of breaking the cycle of evil, which is slides 12 to 13 from chapter 4, and making a case for forgiveness, which is on slides 14 to 16 of chapter 4. These topics are covered in the textbook on pages 127 to 133. This is a slide on breaking the cycle of evil, making a case for forgiveness, and there's four strands that he uses to explain how warring groups can overcome their mutual hatred and bind together to restore fractured relationships. So this is what you as the executive director are going to try and do. You know that the two sides are deeply divided. So make an argument really quickly about how you can um, bring these warring groups together. 
Now, to conclude, as I mentioned, put all of these quiz answers in one single Word document, and then when you've got the Word document done and saved, then you go in before midnight on Sunday night, you go into Blackboard, and here you are, here's the link. Um, it's a brand new link, quizzes and exams, and that will open up quiz number one, which is actually kind of like your first of two midterms. Normally, a class would have one midterm worth 20%, but I wanted to do something that has a little less weight on it, so I've decided, divided that 20% equivalent of your grade into two quizzes. But think of this as your first midterm, because it covers everything from chapters one through six. So this will open up here. Click on that, and what you'll do is you'll come up to each question. I didn't put the entire wording of the question in. I just put the section of the quiz question that specifically tells you what your answer should be like. And so then you cut from your Word document with Control C, so highlight your answer, Control C, click in this box here, Control V, and then your answer is pasted in there, and then save your answer. Okay, and then go on to question two, and then question three, question four. So it should take you about 15 minutes to upload the quiz, and that's all you have to do on Blackboard because everything else you've done throughout the week leading up to that. If, if it isn't clear, just reread the quiz written question because I've given enough preamble in there. And, and if there isn't anything in there that specifically you're looking for, what it means is I want you to make an assumption about this situation. So outline your assumption about these three characters. These are fictitious characters that will only exist in your mind. And the character that you put into your mind that you're using as the mouthpiece for your answer is a person that you make up entirely of your own because you've got a different background than I do. The executive director that I would be is very different from the executive director that you will fabricate in your own mind and that's the beauty of this quiz and that is the challenge of studying ethics because everybody comes with a different history and that's what this quiz is meant to capture is you get to create that person yourself and so if you don't see something in the question that answers about a character trait that you want to define or you have a question about for your character that means that you're supposed to define that character trait yourself. So put a couple of comments in there that say, my character struggles with blank. Or the person that I'm answering for, I see that person struggling with blank. And so you define that character trait and then continue on with your answer. So don't ask me to define a character trait in a person that I can't relate to because you, the whole objective here is that you define a character that you can relate to based on your life experience. Okay? Thank you very much and good luck.